Muy buenos días y sean todos bienvenidos a la primera sesión de nuestro tercer día del Encuentro Académico Latinoamérica Norte. Eh, antes de iniciar, gustaría, me gustaría eh, darles algunos acuerdos importantes. El primero, el chat permanecerá deshabilitado, sin embargo, pueden realizar todas sus preguntas en el apartado de Q&A que encontrarán en la parte inferior de sus pantallas. Si desean, pueden realizar eh, las preguntas en español. Esta sesión será grabada y la subiremos a nuestro canal de YouTube, el Sevier Latam, en la próxima semana. Se entregarán certificados de asistencia por sesión. Las instrucciones las recibirán en el transcurso de la semana. Ahora, estos anuncios para nuestros participantes de uh, Habla Portugués. Hola, buen día a todos. Mi nombre es Marilian Paiva. É, agradeço a presença de todos vocês aqui. Eu quero que vocês saibam que a gente tem a, a gravação, a, vai ser gravado o webinar, e teremos a tradução simultânea em português. Para que vocês possam ativar, é só ver no ícone que aparece aqui embaixo, a, com a, o mundo, um, uma, uma telinha de mundo aparecendo e acionar o português. É, o chat está desabilitado, mas vocês podem mandar suas perguntas no botãozinho de Q&A aqui embaixo e pode mandar em português que eu vou ajudar nas respostas. É, a, a, a gravação estará disponível no canal do YouTube a partir do dia 6 de setembro e após esse período vocês também vão receber os certificados. Muito obrigado com a presença de todos vocês. Gracias Lilian y eh, para todos entonces los asistentes recuerden contamos con la opción de interpretación simultánea la cual pueden activar realizando clic en el icono de interpretación, el icono que parece un mundo y escoger el idioma de referencia. Bueno, para iniciar, entonces, bienvenidos a nuestro tercer día en donde el eje central son las buenas prácticas en el desarrollo sostenible. En esta primera sesión tenemos como invitado a Rob Van Dalen, quien nos hablará de la investigación química para el desarrollo sostenible. Quien les habla es María José Dávila Rodríguez, soy la consultora de clientes para toda la región responsable del portafolio de Ciencias de la Vida. Y nuestro invitado especial de esta mañana es Rob Van Dalen, eh, Senior Publisher aquí en el CEDIER, quien es responsable de una cartera de 14 revistas en los campos de la química verde, sostenible y la fisicoquímica, iniciador del Green and Sustainable Chemistry Challenge, que es un reto que apoya ideas innovadoras de química verde que puedan aplicarse directamente a la comunidad. Es eh, el encargado de organizar la conferencia anual International Colloids Conference y quien ha impartido talleres para autores y editores en América del Norte y Sur, Europa, China, India y el Sudeste Asiático. Rob, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. So, please, uh, you can start uh, sharing uh, your screen and also uh, with the talk. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen now. So um, it's my pleasure and my honor to, to be at this event. And it's great to see that so many people are attending it. So I think the introduction has already been given in, uh, uh, in enough detail, uh, but just to say it from my side. So I'm already a publisher for more than 10 years at Elsphere. And the last couple of years, I'm mainly involved in green and sustainable chemistry. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, research in green and sustainable chemistry and specifically uh, how the role that chemistry plays in developing a sustainable future. You know, whether it's CO2 reduction and utilization, cleaner or low energy production, energy conversion and storage, entire life cycles of chemical products or waste reduction. It's all chemistry. And you see that chemists are aware of this critical role because more and more chemists are entering 
this area of green and sustainable chemistry. But also publishers are critical about this role. And I will also show you a little bit what Elsphere is developing in this respect and how we also try to help to develop the UN SDGs. So you may have heard already that Elsphere has a long history in scientific publishing. The original Elsphere company was started in 1580 in the Netherlands by Louis Elsphere at the University of Leiden. And in 1880, the company made a restart uh, and that was actually the modern Elsphere as we still know today. And among the authors who have published with Elsphere are Galileo. You see the first page of his book here. Uh, Erasmus Descartes, Alexander Fleming, and Jules Verne. And many Nobel Prize winners, especially in chemistry, have published with Elsphere. So I've heard that uh, almost 90% of the Nobel Prize winners have published their important work uh, with Elsphere. And just to give you an example, this is a journal that I handle, uh, Chemical Physics Letters. It's a journal that was started more than 50 years ago. And we discovered that more than 16 Nobel Prize winners published in this journal only. So we made a collection of their papers uh, and republished them again. And we asked the Nobel Prize winners to give a historical perspective on their work, how the research was done uh, in that time. And that became a very nice and interesting issue. Uh, and by the way, uh, this is also from Chemical Physics Letters. Uh, it's not a Nobel Prize winner. So this is a person at those days being very active in chemical physics. And her name is A. Merkel, Angela Merkel. So she, she's in fact the Prime Minister of Germany. So this shows that you know, even if you fail in your chemical career, or if you want to do something completely different, you can still have an influence on the SDGs. So another example that I want to show here is magnetic moments. That's a special issue in the Journal of Magnetic Resonance. And this also contained a number of articles from Nobel Prize winners and their historical perspectives. You see an example here. It's an article by Richard Ernst and he published this article in 1975 on NMR Fourier Zeugmatography. So Richard Ernst studied chemistry at uh, Zurich, the Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule. Schule, and he received his PhD in 1962. After that, he went to the US to work for Varian Associates, the instrument maker, and there he invented Fourier transform NMR, noise decoupling, and a number of other techniques. He returned to Zurich in 1968 to become a lecturer. He didn't have any means to start any new project and because of that he suffered from a serious nervous breakdown. Um, so I know all this from his historical perspective about his research that he published in that volume. But he, you know, he was very much inspired at a conference, an NMR conference in 1974 by a lecture given by Paul Lauterburg who demonstrated an entirely different approach for two and three dimensional, dimensional NMR images by NMR zeugmatography. And he was so inspired by that. And based on that, Ernst developed a far more superior 3D, 3D imaging technique that actually led to the development of the MRI uh, in 1978. So the first prototype of MRI was bait, based on the developments from Richard Ernst uh, in the article that he published in NMR in 1975. And nowadays these MRR machines 
are seen in hospitals all over the world. And Richard Ernst uh, received the Nobel Prize uh, in chemistry uh, for his work in 1991. And of course, this is related to SDG3, good health and well-being. But in those days, uh, of course, the SDGs didn't exist yet. But still, I thought this is a very nice example how chemical research can have a huge influence on, uh, on SDGs. So sustainability and the SDGs and elsewhere. So this is a rather long quote from our CEO at Elsevier, Kumsal uh, Bayezid, but I think it's worthwhile to mention that here. So the UN SDGs uh, set ambitious goals uh, to be met at 2030, and with less than 10 years, Kumsal Bayezid sa says, we all need to ramp up our efforts and to make sure that our targets are met. So the global research community is the backbone of this grant society channels its commitment to finding evidence-based answers is drive is the driving force for advances in global health and well-being poverty reduction and life expectancy and especially now in the uh, COVID pandemic the role of science is very important so elsevier is deeply committed to contribute to this critical global effort both through actions within our organization and through our unique strength in quality information, data and analytical tools to help all stakeholders in research, healthcare, public policies uh, and help to meet the UN SDGs. So that really shows not only our commitment within our chemistry department, but in the whole of Elsphere, uh, our commitment to the UN SDGs. So there are five ways in which Elsphere supports sustainability. So performing data analysis with our data tools, publishing the latest findings in sustainability science, illuminating gender issues, uh, supporting sustainable innovation in developing countries, and bringing research leaders together to exchange knowledge about the sustainable future. So if you want to have more details about that, you can have a look at uh, the link that I've showed over here. So let's first look at performing data analysis. So recently we have uh, uh, published a report that is completely available for free. Uh, and that report is called Mapping Research to Advanced SDGs. So for all the SDGs, uh, we have made an analysis. Uh, we have made the impact in the research field of that particular er area, of that particular SDG, where the main publications are published, which are the main institutes, and also the key themes in that uh, area or in that SDG. And as an example, you see here, a page of SDG 2, Zero Hunger. But the report is available for free and I think it's really worthwhile to have a look at it. So, of course, we have our tools like Science Direct, Scopus and SciFile that can help researchers uh, in their research. And I will give a couple of examples of that. So, I'm working in sustainable chemistry and we see an enormous growth in uh, the number of articles published in sustainable chemistry. It's almost an exponential growth. So it was about 4,000 in 2015 and uh, almost 40,000 in 2020. And in 2021, the increase is even more steep. What we also see is that the field weighted citation impact, so that's the relative impact of this particular research, it's much higher than in the rest of Elsphere uh, and the rest of chemistry. So the real field weighted citation impact is 1.76. This means that these articles are cited 76% more 
than other articles in chemistry. We also see that about 37% of these articles are in the top 10% most cited articles. And for chemistry in general, that's 22%. You can also see in this graphic at the bottom that sustainable chemistry is not only chemistry, uh, it's also chemical engineering and material science. And what we also see is that there is much more international collaboration in sustainable chemistry. It's over 25% for sustainable chemistry, while it is 22% for chemistry. So what may be interesting for you to explore is that on Scopus, you can search on specific SDGs. So if you have access to Scopus, uh, you normally do the basic search and you see this screen, but you can click on the advanced document search. And then on the new screen, you see at the bottom right, uh, you see UN Sustainable Development Goals. If you click on that, you see all the 16 goals. Then you can click on uh, the SDG in which you're interested. Uh, in this case, I did SDG 7, Affordable and Clean Energy. And then you see a very long search uh, string uh, that involves any possible type of renewable energy or, uh, or anything else related to that SDG. And if you actually do that search, if you hit the search button, you get the results, of course. And there are over 1 million document results related to SDG 7. And the top cited uh, result, the top cited article, and this is one from Michael Gretzel on the development of solar cells based on dye-sensitized uh, colloidal uh, TiO2 films. And there are over 24,000 citations to this article. So let me now give you the second example, how uh, chemical research can help the SDGs. So I take now this example of Michael Gretzel. Michael Gretzel studied at the Technical University of Berlin and he got his PhD in 1976. He was, he was doing fundamental research, but he was inspired by an old article by Heinz Gerischer and Maria Michelle Beierle on the sensitization of charge injection into semiconductors. So that was published in Electrochemica Acta in 1968. And, you know, based on that old article, he was able to develop his dye sensitized uh, solar cells. And his first work was published in JAX in 1985. But then in 1991, after much more research and much more developments, he published the article in Nature that was cited over 24,000 times. So the technology is now often described as artificial photosynthesis and a very good alternative to the standard silicon photovoltaics. So it is made of low cost materials and does not need an elaborate apparatus to manufacture. So Gretzel's work has been cited in total over 250,000 times and his age index is over 200. And these cell-based batteries are more convenient for consumers than the silicon-based photocells. They can be made flexible, you know, you can bend them and in various colors. And an example you see here, the picture on the right, uh, that's the use of these cells in the Swiss tech convention center. So it re looks really, really beautiful with nice colors. And this effect uh, uh, generates energy for that building. So this is clearly related to two SDGs, uh, affordable and clean energy and climate action because of the clean energy. So if you look at in Scopus and look at the 
16 SDGs, you see for each SDG, a strong increase in the number of papers. And it is perhaps of no surprise that most research is published related to SDG 3, good health and well-being, and secondly, to affordable and clean energy. Other things like climate action are also doing very strong. So reaccess is also one of the, our tools that can really help uh, to develop uh, sustainable strategies. It's our uh, uh, chemical database with millions of organic compounds in it and millions of chemical reactions. And there is an example in which uh, it helped uh, to find a sustainable solution. So, you know, in the denim production in jeans, uh, which accounts for 14% of the cotton use, that re requires a tremendous amount of clear water. So for each jeans, about two and a half thousand gallons of water are needed. So that's incredible. And also the, you know, the, the dye color indigo, that is quite polluting. So by searching the Reaccess database, uh, researchers were able to find a sustainable solution, a replacement for indigo that will save up to 92% of water, 30% of energy, and 87% of the cotton waste. So the solution, the new dye has been patented and uh, yeah, it's one of the successes of uh, Reaccess. So if only a quarter of the genes are made around the globe using this new dye, there will be enough water saved for to supply 1.7 million people annually. So that's really enormous. So let's look at uh, publishing the latest findings in sustainable science. So I'm working in uh, uh, in green and sustainable chemistry, and these are a couple of journals that I do. Uh, so the first one, the editor is Klaus Kummerer. For the second one, Klaus Kummerer as well. And uh, it has an impact factor of 6.5. Uh, so, so this is only in my portfolio, but if you look more broadly, there are many, many journals within LSV that are directly related to sustainable research and to the UN SDGs. And you see only a fraction of the journals here. Because Klaus Kummerer has been uh, very much involved in my journals, I also give an example of his research and how that contributes to the UN SDGs. So Klaus got his PhD in 1990 uh, at the University of Tübingen. Uh, and he went on to researching pollutants in the aquatic environment with a focus on pharmaceuticals. And after 10 years, he became really more interested in solutions of the problem. And, you know, not just testing and, and analyzing the 500 compound in the 600 test and doing risk assessment without reducing the risk. So he became really interested in the bigger picture and starting with the source and the reasons for pollution. And uh, so he started investigating the benign by design approach. The idea is quite old. It's one of the uh, 12 principles developed by Paul Anastas, one of the 12 principles of green chemistry. But there was little or no research demonstrating its feasibility. So the next step for him was to take it in a much broader, sustainable framework. So, you know, not just uh, looking at the pollutants, but looking at the entire life cycle of a project, as well as the ethics, the resources, and also the educational aspect. So he has published many, many good papers on this, and he is now director of the Institute for Sustainable Chemistry and Environmental Chemistry. 
at the University of Lüneburg in Germany, and he is seen as one of the top scientists in sustainable chemistry. And he is also the chair of our Greener Sustainable Chemistry Conference. And just to give you some ideas for more reading, if you're interested in this. So <clears throat> um, he published a very nice article in Science, in Science Magazine. So it's called Rethink Chemistry for the Circular Economy. Um, so a very interesting article. And also in Angewandte Chemie, Sustainable Chemistry, a Future Guiding Principle. And he published in ACS, Sustainable Chemistry and Engineering. So reducing environmental pollution by antibiotics through design for environmental degradation. He's also involved in the European Commission in a round table discussion. And you can see a podcast, which is in German, uh, about this work. So a remarkable person who has made a real big impact with his research on the SDGs. And by the way, Elsphere is publishing the most important research that we're publishing related to the SDGs in the SDG Resource Center. And these articles are available for free uh, at this uh, research uh, resource center. So you can just click on any of the SDGs and then see the latest research. We did something similar for COVID. So we flagged all our articles uh, in the submission system and made them available for free for everybody around the world in our COVID resource center. And we also made all our content in our journals related to COVID. So for instance, the Lancet, Cell, etc. We made that uh, available free to all our editorial board members because often they didn't have access anymore uh, to these journals because they had to work from home. And an example of the research that we published well is here uh, by uh, uh, Anthony Fauci, uh, the immunologist and the chief med medical advisor of, of Trump holding up a cell paper to, to support his uh, reasoning, to support his arguments. Uh, yeah, just one thing that I want to show that this was an internal presentation for Elsphere employees. And that was a, a, a webinar uh, by uh, Professor Ugo Zahin and Professor Özlem Türeci, both CEOs from Biotech. And in Biotech, uh, they were working on an MRR, uh, sorry, an mRNA-based cancer immunotherapy, but they developed that into the Moderna vaccine. Other speakers in the webinar were uh, Ivan Dikic, He's the director of the Institute of Biochemistry at the Gotha University. And Richard Horton, the editor in chief of the, of the Lancet, was the, uh, the moderator uh, of that uh, uh, webinar. So there was a, a quote, uh, yeah, a nice quote from Professor Sahin. He said, I would like to thank Elsvi for the fantastic work that your team is doing. One of the key reasons that we have started and pivoted our cancer research to infectious disease vaccine was a paper that I had read in The Lancet. So that was a very early paper in January 2020 about uh, the COVID, uh, the start of the COVID pandemic in uh, Wuhan in China. And of course, this is clearly related to SDG three, good health uh, and well-being. So let's look at, a little bit at illuminating gender issues. So I want to be short about this because I believe that there will also be a presentation from Ilan Shem 
from the uh, Elsevier Foundation, and they are very active uh, about gender diversity and gender equality. But also for our journals, we try to have gender diversity in our editorial boards. And there is a piece here at the bottom, it's in Dutch, but uh, the translation is that, is that Elsevier is one of the forerunners in the LHBTI inclusion uh, ranking worldwide. So also within Elsevier internally, we take action on this. So now so supporting sustainable innovation in development countries. So for five years now, we have the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Challenge. And for this challenge, we invite innovative green chemistry ideas that can be directly applied to local communities. Uh, and uh, this year, we focus on uh, climate action with the challenge. So uh, this year, the, the challenge is called Chemistry for Climate Action Challenge. But uh, yeah, to give you a couple of examples of previous winners of the Green and Sustainable Chemistry Challenge, and normally we get about 500 submissions, 500 ideas in uh, for this challenge. So one of the early winners was Susanna Yusup uh, from Malaysia. She developed the biopesticide for rice fields. Other winners were Rania Albakain from Jordan, and she developed a, a, a method for toxic metal removal from wastewater. And Ankur Patwardhan from India, uh, he developed a butterfly attractant to improve ecosystem health. And just to focus a little bit on Susanna Yusup. So one of the first winners of the challenge. So she was born in Sri Lanka in Malaysia and went into to the UK in 1990 and studied in Leeds and Swansea University. And she received her PhD in chemical en engineering uh, from the University of Bradford in 1998. She returned to Malaysia and became an assistant professor at the University of Technology Petronas in uh, Malaysia at the Department of Chemical Engineering. She developed a, really a passion for local communities and she used her her areas of expertise in that. That's biomass conversion, uh, materials development, adsorption and re reaction engineering, and green processes. And she developed that uh, biopesticide for improvement of paddy yield. So really her passion for local communities, because there were a lot of very poor rice farmers in that area. And there was also in, an in, increase in uh, cancer deaths in that area, really because of the nasty pesticides that the people were using. So this biopesticide not only increased the paddy yield, but also will have very good health effects on the local community, on the rice farmers. And she said, well, winning the challenge gave internal re recognition for the opportunity to enhance our research and to support the UN SDGs. And it's captured public attention, particularly the farmers, on the importance of the application of green and sustainable methods for improving paddy yield. And the research support received through the LSV Foundation also enabled us to accelerate our research in a transdisciplinary manner, manner, collaborating with people from industry, farmers, and also government bodies. Also the government got interested in her project. So this is clearly related again to good health and well-being and to life on land. So bringing together research leaders to exchange ideas. Well, for me, I organized this Green and Sustainable Chemistry Conference, and that will be held uh, online, unfortunately online, in November. We hope that next year the conference can be again in person. 
And we had many famous speakers at the conference. We had the Minister of the Environment from Germany, the President of the German Chemical Society. We had Paul Anastas from Yale University. So that's the person who developed the 12 principles of green chemistry. We had Michael Gretzel mentioned earlier and Johan Rockström uh, a couple of years ago from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, who developed the nine planetary boundaries. So Johan Rockström identified nine items and he calculated when the tipping point would be reached and when there was basically a point of no return for these, uh, uh, for these points. And also our CEO, uh, Kumsal Bayezid, did an uh, interesting opening talk. So let me now focus on one of the speakers of last year's conference. That's Alexei Lepkin. So he received his Master in Chemistry in Biochemistry uh, at Novosibirsk State University in Russia in 1994. After that, he went to the UK and he earned his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Bath. He is now professor of sustainable reaction engineering at the University of Cambridge. And his group is developing cleaner manufacturing processes uh, for industry. And they are mainly focused on liquid and multiphase catalytic biochemical processes. But lately, his current focus is on the development of innovative digital technologies to address sustainability and challenges in the chemical industry. So they're working on developing machine learning methods and big data approaches to design reaction pathways for circular economy. And they are also actively pursuing development of machine learning and artificial intelligence methods for process developments. So here you see a slide that he was so kind to share with me. So he's working on collecting data, how things behave, make data available for smart algorithms, find synergies, minimize the use of resources, minimize costs, and find the best ways of deliv delivering customer defined functions. And he's working together with Professor Marcus Kraft and Bas F on this. Here is a little bit more uh, uh, about his uh, research. So there he's working on the cyber physical nature paradigm. So the true noosphere. I didn't know actually what the noosphere was, so I had to look it up. So that has been developed, that idea has been developed by Vernatsky and uh, Leroy and Chardin from France. Uh, and uh, if you look it up in Wiki, uh, so the noosphere, the noosphere represents the highest states of biospheric development, its defining factor being the development of humankind's rational activities. So all very interesting. So again, yeah, collecting data from nature and learning from the interaction, learn to predict the impact of molecules on ecosystems and learn to predict the long range and long lasting interactions and drastically reduce consumption and learn to live within the planetary boundaries that has been developed by Johan Rockström. So here's a, a, a quote from uh, uh, Vernatsky, uh, the Russian, Ukrainian, Soviet biochemist, and this is from 1992. So all very interesting work. And yeah, if you look at uh, a couple of the examples that I mentioned, so what struck me in these examples was from Richard Ernst, the perseverance, you know, he continued with his research despite, you know, the, the nervous breakdown that he had, despite the fact that he didn't get any funds. And he ended up with the Nobel Prize. Michael Gretzel, he continued 
to be curious and he found a very old article from 1968 that really helped his research and helped him develop these solar cells and he's now one of the most cited chemists in the world. Klaus Kummerer, he went beyond his regular borders and he's now one of the most important sustainable chemists uh, in the world. Susanna Yusup, she had that passion for local communities and she really was the developed, she re really was determined to help them and she developed that biopesticide for rice field. And Alexei Lepkin, the last example, so he is really applying uh, really state-of-the-art techniques like machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence to help to reach the UN SDGs. And I want to, to end with a quote from uh, Professor Aslam uh, Turecci from BioNTech. So she said, I think the most important step to be prepared for failures and to pivot uh, it and to accept that the very nature of innovation is that you have to enter unknown territory and that you have to navigate it. And that will come with expect unexpected situations and not every attempt to solve a problem will be the final solution, but continue your research and try to find good solutions. So this was it, what I had to say. Just, I just want to mention the Research Academy that there's a, a wealth of information for how to write uh, an article the publication process, uh, navigating peer review, etc. So I hope that uh, yeah, I found these researchers that I mentioned very uh, inspiring. I hope that was also inspiring for you. I want to thank you for your attention and I hope that this will also inspire you to do green chemistry, green research, and that will mean hopefully more green leaves of this on this tree of sustainability. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I can also answer them now. And otherwise, feel free to contact me by mail. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob, for your amazing uh, presentation. So uh, we're going to start the Q and A session, and we already have different. Uh, questions here. So Andrea is asking us, is there something we uh, as students can make to help raising? So, so sorry, uh, the, the acoustic was not very clear. Uh, can you repeat okay. the question, please? Yes, Andrea is asking if there is something we as students can make to help reaching the SDG number three, gut health and well-being. Ah, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. The, I already gave a couple of examples with Richard Ernst and Susanna Yusup. So uh, yeah, look at your talents, look at uh, what you're good at and try to develop that. And also be curious, uh, look at, and you don't have to invent everything by yourself. Look at already published research, go to conferences uh, or go to online conferences, listen to what other people are doing, try to collaborate and uh, yeah, and look for your passion. And an example for the passion that uh, Susanna Yusup had was, yeah, really to help local communities. Okay, thank you. So, Clelia is asking if uh, a scientific paper, a scientific research, uh, can have more than one SDG, and how to how to present that. Uh, yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, indeed, 
uh, articles and research can be related to more than one SDG. An example was that I mentioned was uh, Michael Kretzel. So his uh, work was clearly related to clean energy, but also to climate action, because, you know, these solar cells mean much less air pollution and, and CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. So, uh, yeah, uh, so I think it's not, not a problem at all to have research and papers related to more than one SDG. And you can make that clear in your introduction or in your summary. Thank you. Sergio is asking, uh, well, this is more of your experience as editor. Uh, what are or which are the main reasons you identify for the success of highly uh, cited works, research? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, that's an interesting question. So, um, yeah, well, the example that I mentioned, uh, sustainable chemistry, which is, of course, a very broad field, which is related to many of the SDGs. But you, uh, what I mentioned was that the field weighted citation impact was 1.76 for sustainable chemistry. So that actually means that uh, uh, work in, these, in this area is cited on average 76% more than other chemistry work. So, you know, if you want to publish highly cited work, you can look at the hot areas uh, in chemistry or in other areas of science. Uh, you can, well, it, it of course depends on the analysis tools that you have available, but using, for instance, Copus, you can see what the relative impact is of specific types of research and specific uh, research related to SDGs. So you could choose an area that is hot, that is cited a lot. And that's no guarantee for your work to be cited a lot, but it can certainly help. And of course, uh, what also helps to get more citations to your work is to write a re to, to first of all do good research and then write a really good article on it. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Robin, there is a question from Ariadne. Ariadna. Uh, she's thanking you very much for your talk. And um, about the colorant, describe it. How exactly Reaxis was used in order to get the better than indigo colorant? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, uh, um, yeah, I. I must, I wasn't involved, uh, directly involved in that. And if you want to have more details, uh, I can send it to the team later and they can share it with you. Um, but I found this, that this was a really cool example and that's why I showed it. But I am afraid that I don't know the exact details. So I have to, ask my colleagues in Reaccess and I can come back to you. But, you know, they searched, the, the, uh, they looked at, uh, the, at the reaction schemes and they searched for alternatives that would, in theory, work as good as the Indigo compound. But, it, yeah, to give you more details, I have to come back on this. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, the following question is also related to uh, Ariadna. You mentioned that there are many more publications in regard to the green conversion of the chemistry processes, but is there a tool or, a strat or strategy 
using science direct or reaxis to know if those proposals are introduced to the actual chemical more contaminant processes in the industry? Uh, yeah, it's a little bit related to the previous question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, um, yeah, um, I believe that Reaccess has now uh, also, uh, you know, the, that they're offering alternative, green alternatives for specific compounds in specific reactions. So mm -hmm. that may be a, a way to look at it. Uh, but uh, again, I must say I'm not an expert in Reaccess. And it may be an idea to have uh, one of my colleagues from Reaccess to give a short presentation on this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what about uh, how we, or well, yes, the society can follow in if the industries are implementing more uh, sustainable approach in their processes? Yeah, so the question was uh, how we can ensure that industries mm -hmm. are, are implementing these green approaches. Yeah, well, um, um, yeah, the, a complicated question. Uh, the, you know, it's, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, I think uh, one of the things it depends on is also the consumers because sometimes uh, green products or green processes are more expensive. But if consumers are willing to pay for that, then uh, uh, the industries will be willing to implement these processes. Uh, I heard, for instance, an example from a pharmaceutical company that was able to, uh, uh, to develop biodegradable antibiotics and antibiotics is also a problem in the environment eh? because uh, yeah, it's non-degradable and it just stays in the environment. Uh, um, so especially areas with a lot of agriculture that can suffer from more antibiotics in, in, that, uh, uh, in the environment. So, but, uh, you know, there was a pharmaceutical company that said, yeah, we are able to make antibiotics that are biodegradable, but that will cost twice as much. The end product will cost twice as much as the normal antibiotics. And we believe that consumers are not willing to pay that amount. So, yeah, yeah, yeah you, you know, it, it's, yeah, there are lots of things involved. The, 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 the process should be manageable. It should be cost effective and, uh, and also consumers should be willing uh, to pay probably extra for the end product. Okay, there is another question here. Uh, do you think should journals start adding tags and logos of the corresponding SDGs into each paper to publish? Yeah, that's a nice idea. That's a very nice idea. So I believe that some journals are already doing that. Uh, so for instance, Chem, uh, that's a journal, a chemistry journal published by Cell Press. And uh, yeah, just by coincidence, uh, one of the journals uh, that I'm doing is uh, uh, Materials Today Sustainability. And another one is Current Opinion in Green and Sustainable Chemistry. And uh, in these articles, we ask the authors to list a number of highlights. So these are just bulleted points, uh, which are the, yeah, the main uh, points of the article. And we have now asked authors to reserve one of these highlights to indicate to which SDG 
the article is related. So a good question and uh, yeah, we are already working on that. Okay. There's a question uh, from Ismael. Uh, if you know that the research related to COVID-19 are already considering the SEDD topics? Yeah, uh, well, yes, uh, well, very, very often this type of research is uh, related to, to health and well-being, to SDG3. Uh, so, um, yeah, and we, uh, yeah, so we identify these articles uh, in our submission system. So all articles are of course submitted electronically and by text mining and text search on COVID and Corona. And I don't know what, uh, we search the articles that are related to, uh, to COVID and then we publish them online for free. Uh, does that answer your question or? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> uh, another question is uh, from Ariadna is as as a witness of how the scientists are willing to reduce the human impact in the environment what do you think they would do in order to accelerate changes No oh, wow <laughs> That's <laughs> that's a, a really you know uh, a very tricky, a very important question, a very difficult question to answer. Um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, yeah, one of the main things is uh, politics and regulations. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have now seen uh, in the IPCC report in the recent IPCC report that uh, climate is definitely changing and that's happening by what the humans are doing in the last 200 years. And if we don't change our behavior, uh, yeah, there will be uh, uh, catastrophic results. So now you also see this uh, back in politics and governments that are requiring, at least in the European Union, uh, so governments requiring uh, their industries to take measures and also the local communities to take measures. So I think uh, there can a lot, there are a lot of things that can be done by individuals, by changing their individual behavior. Uh, there can be a lot of things that can be done by scientific research and to point out uh, what has to be done. For instance, these nine planetary boundaries by Johan Ruckström. That is very interesting research and I can recommend to have a look at that. And also governments, so they have to, at a certain moment, enforce some measurements on us um, uh, and to change our behavior and to change the behavior of industries. Okay, great. Thank there is a... Uh, yeah, should we go? I believe uh, we have uh, time for uh, two more questions. So I just uh, saw the, the list. And there is one about if there are another organic uh, organic pesticides applied to other crops. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the question doesn't seem complete to me. So, but uh, the, the, this is about. So you 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 mentioned the, the example with the rice uh, crops and yeah. the use of these organic pesticides. So yep. there are examples of other organic pesticides are using in another kind of crops with, yes. a, uh, with success. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, uh, um, so we gave an award. So we gave the first prize to this example, to this biopesticide that has been made from plant extracts uh, because 
we saw that it could be directly applied to local communities. And we thought that was very sympathetic. But there are also companies that are uh, developing uh, organic and bio-based uh, pesticides. There are already uh, quite a number of examples on that. So it's not only that lady, uh, that professor in Malaysia that's working on it. There are also many other researchers and also companies that are working on this. Yeah. Okay, and just to wrap up everything, do you have any advice in how to collaborate and how to share our uh, research, our ideas to do research with the world in a good way? Yeah, um, uh, collaboration is extremely important. Uh, so um, as we have seen in the slides and in the examples uh, that I mentioned, all the people that I mentioned were somehow inspired by other people. So you don't have to invent the wheel by yourself. Uh, so look at existing research, look at, uh, uh, try to attend conferences, uh, 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 talk to other people as much as possible, share, uh, talk about what you are doing. And you can also find uh, a lot of things online. So you, you can, for instance, look at your research that you're doing or that you're interested in. Uh, looking scopers and for instance find the top institutes in that field uh, and you know you can try to contact researchers in these institutes and try to set up a collaboration and of course also sharing your own research is very important by publishing your research in good journals and sharing it at conferences which always give a lot of exposure Okay, thank you so much, Rob, for your work to, for being with us today. So My now pleasure. it's time to, uh, well, uh, some important information to all our, our attendees. So I'm going to switch again into Spanish. Eh, muchísimas gracias a todos por eh, su participación el día de hoy. En este momento ustedes podrán encontrar en sus pantallas una encuesta para calificar eh, y darnos sus opiniones sobre esta charla. Y recuerden que hoy en la tarde seguimos con la programación de El Tercer Día, Mejores Prácticas en Desarrollo Sostenible. Mañana y el viernes también tendremos actividades relacionadas con eh, impactando los ODS mediante la colaboración y rankings pueden acceder a la agenda completa en el código QR que se está mostrando.